Well, I'm a relative newcomer to the humanitarian space, so I speak with a degree of uh, modesty and humility about this. But I think it's useful to think, first of all, about the demand side and secondly, about the supply side. On the demand side of the humanitarian system, we've obviously got a growing number of crises, uh, the UN declaring level three crises with a rapidity that hasn't been seen before, a frequency that hasn't been seen before, growing complexity of uh, crisis, obviously driven uh, by some very deep trends uh, to do with resources as well as uh, the eruption of some religious sectarianism in places that we haven't seen it before, for example, the Central African Republic. So on the demand side, we have growing uh, complexity and we're a growth industry for all the wrong reasons. On the supply side, I would diagnose two things, fatigue on the one hand and fragmentation on the other. Uh, fatigue uh, from the traditional Western public, Western donors, and fragmentation, not just in terms of the multitude of organizations. I was told uh, the day before yesterday that the number of NGOs, international NGOs registered with 501c3s has gone up from 4,000 to 12,000 in the last decade in the US, um, but also obviously growing numbers of players from outside the traditional source of humanitarian help in the Western world, uh, Muslim majority countries, and of course, um, also a growing number of players in the private sector as well. So I think that there is fragmentation and fatigue uh, on the demand side. And uh, if you combine supply and demand, what you see is a very testing situation. I think that when it comes to challenges and opportunities uh, for the humanitarian sector, I, I have to look at this through the lens of the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. Uh, we're obviously focused in conflict and fragile states, conflict-ridden and fragile states, where increasing numbers of the world's poor, or at least an increasing percentage of the world's poor, are concentrated. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a shift towards urbanization of the refugee population and the IDP population, which is in tune with wider global uh, trends. Uh, that's undoubtedly a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. I think that there are significant uh, opportunities that are presented by the uh, turning of rhetoric about partnership with local civil society into reality. Uh, the growth of dynamic civil societies in the places where we work and the requirement that we partner with them in new ways, I think, can be seen as a challenge, but I would uh, also put it in the opportunity uh, basket. Uh, thirdly, there's undoubtedly growing challenge in respect of the levels of violence. There are often random violence uh, that we see in the countries and communities in which we're working, but the levels of violence are, are undoubtedly making the uh, places where we're working uh, increasingly inhospitable uh, to us. I think finally, there's undoubtedly an opportunity in the range of new partners that are uh, playing a role in some of the most challenging places. It is striking uh, to see that the phenomenon of uh, global capital movements is affecting our sector as well, or the countries that we're working in, as well as uh, more affluent communities. And I think that there's a big challenge, but a big opportunity in how we engage with the private sector as well. Predictions are always dangerous when they're about the future, as uh, someone uh, famously uh, said. But I think that you can see um, some trends. The humanitarian sector will increasingly have to get to grips with the fact that it is dealing with natural disaster as well as man-made disaster at the same time. I mean, these two facets coming together. Secondly, uh, we will be dealing with increasing concentrations of the world's poor. 50% of the world's poor now live in conflict states. And I think that's going to be an increasing feature of our work. Uh, thirdly, uh, the drive to localization. Uh, USAID requiring 30% of uh, funding to be spent on local partners. That is our harbinger of the future. And I think also, in addition to that, there's going to be an increasing integration of economic and social programs over the next uh, 10 years uh, as we seek sustainable solutions for populations who are displaced for long periods of uh, time. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, how the system works through some of its challenges over the next uh, 10 years, uh, the absolute imperative is that we remain focused on the goals that we're trying to achieve and the people that we're trying to serve, um, rather than being trapped by the systems within which we operate. I think that the Sphere project has undoubtedly been a very significant 
intellectual and practical contributor uh, to uh, the development of our sector over this uh, period. IRC has been proud uh, to be a part of it. I think that establishing a technical, practical standards uh, for the humanitarian sector has been a, a, a big labor, a labor of love, but also a, a big labor uh, as well. And I hope that uh, in its next incarnation, the Sphere project can deepen and broaden the coalition that has come together to try to put those uh, Sphere standards into practice. And it seems to me that we have a responsibility to recognize that our sector is diversifying fast and that it's very, very important that the thinking and the work that's been done through the Sphere project uh, recognizes that and embraces it.